guys, welcome to our VC34 PE revision lecture for the September series of ATAR notes. So my name's Angelica and I'm going to be your lecturer today. So yeah, we're just going to get into it. So ATAR notes started in around 2007 as kind of a means to even out the VC playing field and create lots of really great free resources for students all over the country to kind of ensure that they have access to like really helpful resources that will help them succeed and do the best they can. So as I mentioned, we started in 2007. Um, it's kind of a big online platform with tons of different resources. And so we have study notes, which are free and downloadable. I think these are really useful for annotating and making notes with. So just instead of compiling and writing all of your own notes, annotating someone else's, which is obviously done really well in the studies, can be a lot more effective. We've got lectures just like this one. So you have, if you haven't yet signed up, definitely check out the other ones. So we've got, um, I'm also doing the bio ones in particular, so bio one, two, and three, and four. So if you are interested in that, check that out. And if you are interested in the other ones, sign up for them. They are free, so they're really great revision tools. Um, we've got the online discussion forum. So this was my favorite part of the website, which I really did use in high school. Uh, so particularly in year 11, when I was doing 3-4 bio, I would pop into this forum whenever I had questions and just, I used an anonymous name and everything because I found it a bit like nerve wracking, um, like asking questions aloud in class sometimes. And so I would like, write on this forum the questions I had and someone would get back to me really quickly. So yeah, it's really good, especially if you're doing practice exams and you've got a bunch of questions and you don't want to bother your teacher at like 10 p.m. on a Tuesday night or something like that. Just pop it on the forum and someone can get back to you really quickly. I've also got really great short bite-sized videos which are engaging little online revision tools. Newsletters to keep you updated and stay in the loop and the ATAR calculator, which I thought was a really fun tool to kind of see how I was going in my studies and if I was kind of on track to get the ATAR I wanted. It is a bit of fun. Um, I spent too much time on it there because I felt like I definitely did. It was often like, oh, I need to get this grade in order to get this ATAR I needed and <laughs> it was a bit time consuming really. We also have articles. Um, so if you're like me, you might actually prefer things in a written form. And so there are lots of articles written by past high scoring VC students who um, you know, give advice about how to do well in particular subjects or how to just study in particular. Because I often find it's difficult figuring out how you study. So definitely check those out. Um, we've also got to keep some more to check out our website. I know it says like free and you might be like, oh, what if it's got like an extra you know, added cost later? It's completely free. You don't have to pay for anything. So I highly, highly recommend it. There's no, like, put in your credit card or whatever. So, yeah, even if you want to use a fake name, go for it. Because I just think, I used to go to these lectures personally when I was in high school and you often hear the lecturer saying, oh, yeah, jump on the a tennis website, it's free and it's great. And I'd be like, yeah, whatever. But the minute I actually started using it, I definitely increased my confidence in bio in particular quite a lot. And I would, you know, spam the forums with questions I had and I'd get really detailed feedback on how to improve my questions and I answered that in order to target um, V cars, like, criteria. So I really recommend. So if there's anything you take away from this lecture, it's definitely sign up for ATAR notes, even if you use a free um, anonymous fake name or something like that. Whoops. Okay, let's get started. So yeah, as I mentioned, my name's Angelica and I'm going to be doing the P34 lecture for this September series. So I graduated in 2019 with a 97.25 ATAR. Whoops. Um, I got a 49 bio, 43 and 47 English, and I completed my biomedical science degree at Monash last year, so that was a three-year degree, and I'm now doing medicine at Monash, uh, which is a four-year degree. I did a bio B in English at Chipsmart, and I love um, bio in particular, it's my favourite subject, and I found that P kind of overlaps quite a bit with bio, which I think is really interesting. Um, I love my cats, these are my cats, and my dog, um, long distance running. I was reading in cafes. So, yeah. If you've got any questions, definitely pop them in the chat. I know it can be a bit, um, I don't know, worrying or nervous making to like write a question in the chat, but just like have a go. If you have got a question, let me know and I can get back to you and answer as soon as possible because um, I know the exams are coming up and it can be a bit of a stressful time. So, if there's anything you want clarified, please just pop it in the chat and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So we've got quite a bit to go through in today's lecture. Um, there is like a huge amount of content. Like I think these are super content heavy subject. I'm really thirsty. Um, yeah, so we're going through tips for each area. We've got a Q&A at the end of each content block. I know it says that, but I think 
I'd prefer it if you guys just put questions whenever you think of them. So if you have a question right now, pop it in the chat right now so I can answer it. Um, so I'll be answering everything during this live stream. The lecture slides will be available afterwards and emailed out today and they're um, recorded later. We will be moving super fast through the content and I've actually included, you can see here, tons of content um, for the entirety of the year. And I know that's a lot of content. I'm not even expecting to get through all of it because I know it's a sheer, like just a huge sheer amount of content. So the reason I put so much stuff into this lecture is that you guys can download them afterward and it's a really great free resource that you can kind of use as a study guide um, for your own study. So even if we don't go through, you know, all of the cute responses, at least you have the notes here that you can use to annotate or use as a reference for your own studies. Okay, so please don't be mad if we don't go through everything. I'm trying my best to get through everything I can in these two hours. If there's anything you miss out on or you prefer to go through, maybe check back on our previous lectures from like our July series or earlier on in the year. I'm going to go through it then. Um, otherwise, you know, put it in the chat and I can try and explain it a bit over like a message. Um, but yeah. We will be moving fast, and I'm sorry about that. There's only so much I can do in these two hours, so yeah. Hopefully, it's okay. I'm off the water. Okay, so PE is pretty intensive. I can really the font. Oh, okay, I made the font big because we're in Unit Four right now. But I did biomedical science, and it had a lot of biophysics, like mechanics, biomechanics, biology. Um, physiology, respiration, cardiac stuff. PE covers all of this and more, which I think is a crazy amount of content. And so for a subject that people often think, oh yeah, it's really easy, it's actually pretty intensive. So I really recommend going back through and revising everything quite detailed um, in order to ensure that you actually are understanding everything because it's such a lot of content and it can be a subject that you can score really well at, but you do have to like make sure that you are... Um, taking the time to consolidate and revise everything. So in terms of unit three, we've got movement skills, coaching, practice and feedback, biomechanics, energy systems, and acute responses. In unit four, we've got activity analyses, fitness component, fitness testing, training methods and principles, psychological and nutritional strategies, and chronic adaptations. So hopefully you guys have done most of this by now, and if you haven't, hopefully it'll be a bit of a, an intro to these topics. I know some um, students have been, like haven't yet done some of these things at the end, uh, if it helps you, maybe rewatch this lecture later on, like closer to the exam, if it does make you feel better, or you know, after you've got kind of a bit of a background or foundation in these things, it might be better as a revision tool. Otherwise, you can download these slides and read them later. Okay, so I've added the dot points from um, study design on most of these slides, I think. I'm not going to read them because it's going to take too long. Anyway, so it's really, there are lots of definitions in PE that you do have to know because you're often asked to define them. So you have to get a one mark question which says define fundamental motor skills or define open motor skills or define gross motor skills. So make sure that you do understand these things. Most of the words which are written in bold, I'd actually recommend making a glossary of and trying to work your way through and make sure that you actually have a full solid understanding of these words and that you can explain them. I find it really useful to try and teach your pets or your family or like a little stuffed toy or something like that. Just because the act of explaining it aloud often requires you to like see how much you can recall or how much you can articulate well. And this is pretty much what you need to do with the examiners, right? You need to explain every single concept that you've learned and be able to convey that to them. So if you can't do it out loud, I think it's going to be difficult to do it on the actual exam. So yeah, my advice is really trying to like recall all these words and give a short explanation or definition as to what they are or what they mean. And yeah, articulate that quite succinctly. So anything bolded, I recommend making glossary of or making flashcards out of. So, fundamental movement skills. These are basic skills that can allow individuals to develop sport-specific sport -specific skills. Um, fundamental movement skills include things such as walking, running, and throwing, or catching a ball. And they can be kind of leveled up into sport-specific skills, which are things like, um, okay, well, for instance, fundamental can include something like rowing, whereas sport-specific can be um, pitching, right? in like baseball or something like that. So it's like a level up particular skill. We've got open and closed motor skills. These also must be um, in your repertoire, I guess, or things that you can define. So open motor skills are skills performed in an unpredictable environment, um, whereas closed motor skills are performed in a predictable environment. Um, 
Gross motor skills involve the use of large muscle groups such as running, and fine motor skills involve the use of smaller muscle groups or muscles. And the use of precise movements, so things such as darts or chess, are considered fine motor skills. We've also got discrete, sorry, um, discrete motor skills which have a clear beginning and end, such as throwing a ball, and serial motor skills which are a combination of discrete skills performed together, such as a gymnastics routine or a dance routine. Continuous motor skills have no beginning or end point, and these include things such as running, swimming, or cycling. Okay, those are all three main ones. So if you have to put down a continuous skill, I'd recommend just putting one of those three down. It seems to be frozen. So what are movement skills? Um, well, we've already done that, I guess. Now we're moving on to constraints, space coaching and constraints. So any factor that can affect an individual's ability to learn and perform a skill is called a constraint, and this can be broken into three categories. So we've got individual constraints, such as body shape and size, fitness level and mental skills, and in terms of task constraints, we've got things such as rules for sport, resources and equipment available, team size, and number of players. We also have environmental constraints, which include things such as physical environment, weather, societal norms, as well as coaching available and support from family and friends. So it is really important that you can identify perhaps three from each of these categories. So individual constraints are pretty much um, traits or characteristics about a personal a person. Um, so things such as body shape and size, fitness level, mental skills, cognitive ability, concentration, um, stuff like that would all be considered individual constraints. Task constraints are things which can you, you can quite easily modify. So rules of the sport, like if, if I'm the coach and we're playing a game of basketball, I can say, you know what, we're not using a basketball anymore, we're using a tennis ball. I can change the rules of the sport. Uh, resources and equipment available, um, these, this is easily modifiable once again, so you can change, you can you know, increase the amount of resources you have, increase the amount of equipment, or reduce the number of equipment, or something like that. Team size and number of players is something which is really easy to adapt or modify. Um, and then we've got things such as environmental constraints. And these include things which you can't really control. Like, they're definitely out of your control. So things such as the physical environment, such as parks, herbals, etc. So it's like saying, you know, I can't just change that there is no, um, you know, football pitch in my street. You can't just change that really instantly. So it's going to be an environmental constraint. Weather, um, you know, if you live in a really hot environment by the ocean, it might be really good area for surfing. Whereas if you live in the snow, it's probably going to be good for skiing or snowboarding as opposed to surfing. So really considering these things like weather um, and terrain. Uh, we've got societal norms. So things such as in Victoria, I'd say AFL is pretty common. Whereas in New South Wales, perhaps rugby is a bit more common. So kind of recognising these different societal differences or norms can allow you to better recognise environmental constraints. Um, coaching available is another um, environmental constraint. And also support from family and friends. It's not like within your control, it's not a task constraint, and it's not really something that is relevant to the individual themselves. It's more like the external environment which surrounds that individual. Um, so there's a really important part of the study design which examines motor skill development and participation. And so basically research has found that reduced medical development will actually lead to decreased participation and performance in physical activity. And so if a child doesn't develop these core motor skills when they're younger, so things such as running, jumping, balancing, catching, etc., they're actually less likely to participate in physical activity, which means they're less likely to develop sport-specific motor skills, meaning that their performance in sports will be decreased. So you can see here um, on this graph, we've got motor skill development and participation slash performance levels. And so, if their motor skills are quite low, their performance and participation will be quite low as well. Whereas if it's a lot higher, it might be a bit higher here. I feel like I'm going to sneeze. Hmm. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so, uh, something else to note just on the previous slide real quick is that you might be asked to explain why this is detrimental. So if kids aren't participating in sports, they may not exercise as much, and so they might actually get less physical activity than is required. Um, they're also more prone to disorders such as obesity or overweight, um, type 2 diabetes, um, higher cholesterol levels, stuff like that. Lots of different um, metabolic syndromes and things can be quite common or prevalent amongst people who do not participate in sports as much. And 
uh, a root cause of a lot of this lack of participation can be due to an absence of these core motor skills developed as a kid. So this is why it's really important to encourage younger children to participate in sports and develop things such as running skills, or jumping, balancing, throwing, catching, etc. Okay, so we've got QMA coming up next. So a QMA is used to assess human movement. The idea is then to use the assessment to improve the movement in some way, ultimately increasing performance in a particular sport. So qualitative movement analysis may also be used by coaches and teachers, amongst others, to help identify strengths and weaknesses of players and also predict their potential. And we've got four principles. Preparation, which involves the observer or coach having a strategy for their observation. This involves um, having a specific reason for performing the analysis and having a strong knowledge of the sport. I know I'm reading a lot, so I'm going to try and cut that down a bit because we do have quite a lot to get through. And I don't want to spend so much time reading. So preparation, pretty much preparing your strategy for observation. Um, knowing what you're going to be looking out for, knowing who you're going to be watching out for, knowing what particular skills you're trying to, you know, recognise or determine if the player is doing well at, okay? Just kind of preparing. If you're going to use technology, knowing what you're going to use, stuff like that. Uh, sorry, it's a bit hard to read. Every time I, like, reformat things, sometimes it ends up looking weird and I don't notice until later. I'm really sorry, guys. So observation involves watching the team or player and maybe perform live or digitally, which is the main key point here. Something else is that it can be quite subjective because multiple observers may watch the same performance and have very different opinions about it. And so a way to decrease this subjectivity and increase objectivity is to employ things such as rating scales and checklists. So it's like looking out for things like, oh, did this um, you know, gymnast do a somersault? This gymnast do the splits? And just ticking it off. And then you actually have a more objective measurement there as opposed to something which can be Subject to personal inflection or bias. Um, I know I moved the writing was down there because I swear it wasn't like this before. Anyway, uh, we've got the next stage, which is the evaluation stage. Stage. Um, it's also called a diagnosis stage. So basically, evaluation involves judging the quality of performance that was observed. And in a qualitative movement analysis, it involves identifying an issue. So evaluating, like when your teachers evaluate your performance in school, it's kind of like, they're sort of judging your performance. Um, in order to help you improve, right? That's kind of what evaluation is in the coaching, so in qualitative movement analysis. So we can use things such as checklists and rating skills to try and increase objectivity and evaluate or um, you know, categorize the performance of the individual. Validity is another measure. It refers to whether a test or method actually measures what it claims to measure. And reliability refers to whether a test or method produces consistent results. Inter rate of reliability um, and intra related reliability are key terms that you must know. They do come up pretty often, and you're often asked to compare them. So, inter rate of reliability refers to the degree of agreement amongst different observers, and it can be increased by having observers undertake similar training and use the same scoring system. Um, and an intra rate of reliability refers to the consistency of scores given by the same assessor. That's a lot of writing or like a big slab of information. So I'm going to try and like break down a bit. So the way I think of it is international. If you're traveling internationally, you're going to different countries. Like you're leaving Australia and going overseas, okay, to like Finland or Switzerland or somewhere, right? That's international. I don't know if anyone uses the word intranational, but say we do. International would just mean you stay within Australia. You might go, you know, all around Victoria or something. It's just you stay in the same country. You stay in one country. By the same token, inter-related reliability means going to, like, to separate or different set of countries, different people, different observers, and asking um, about their evaluation of the performance. You can actually increase the reliability of this by having observers undertake similar training and use the same scoring system, so maybe using a checklist or something like that. Um, intro rate of reliability, this refers to the consistency of scores given by the same assessor. And so someone who perhaps, um, you know, um, judges gymnastics, I'm just using gymnastics as an example, they might, you know, watch one performance <clears throat> on one video and they might give them a really good, give the gymnast a really good grade. Then they might watch the same performance like three days later and they might be in a really bad mood and then just give that performer a really bad grade just because they're not happy. So, iterated reliability kind of 
refers to trying to take out this subjectivity and just ensure that the subject, the consistency of schools given by the same assessor is consistent, right? They don't change stuff depending on mood. If they watch the same performance, they give the same score each time. And so once again, using checklists or rating scales can help to improve that subjectivity, um, or well, improve the objectivity by reducing the subjectivity, okay? Our next stage is the error correction stage, and so it's also known as the intervention stage, but don't call it that in your exam, call it the error correction stage. It involves trying to fix any mistakes that were observed during the earlier stages. So like during half time of a football match when a coach addresses his team, he's trying to fix potential issues that he observed using qualitative movement analysis. Uh, if you've got any questions about that, please put them into the chat right now and I will answer them. I've run out of water. I might give you guys a break like halfway through. So that I can go and get some water, um, or maybe a quarter of the way through. Um, so definitely pop your questions in the chat. I'll just be like super quick and just go get water. Um, maybe after this little content block. Okay, so social cultural factors can affect um, all three stages of learning. And some examples include time, self-belief, role models, religion, should be more. Um, there are a bunch of them. And so they can affect the three stages of learning. I know this is quite early on in the year that we did this but we've got cognitive, associative, and autonomous stages of learning. It's really important that you do know what these mean and understand what occurs at each of these levels. So in the cognitive stage, learners are often trying to work out what skills they need to perform, and their performance will be inconsistent at a lower level. So they're still trying to figure things out. It's pretty much the beginner stage. They don't know much about the sport or how to like, perform well at it, and they'll generally ask a bunch of questions. Um, often, you know, simple instructions and lots of visual demonstrations are really important as is, you know, consistent positive feedback, as it can allow students to, um, you know, feel encouraged and want to pursue the sport in particular. You can see here some other factors can include personality, family dynamics, resources, etc. So we'll go through a few of them. Um, so just firstly, before we get into that, in the associated stage of learning, this is kind of like the intermediate stage. Um, so in this stage, the individual becomes more consistent and continues to refine their technique. And so movements are generally more gradual and lots of practice will be performed. So they're kind of getting better. They're kind of like in the middle stage. They're like, yes, I sort of know what I'm doing, uh, but I'm not really an expert, you know? In this stage, practice should start to become more varied and unpredictable, meaning that it kind of replicates a real game scenario better um, for a real life game scenario better because then you kind of get more practice for the unpredictable nature of an actual game. Um, learners will start to recognize their own mistakes so they are starting to get better at recognizing their mistakes or their faults in their playing um, and yeah. Something to note is generally most athletes, um, I wouldn't even say athletes, most people who do partake in sports and things, they generally remain in this associative or intermediate stage for the rest of their life. And because the advanced stage or the autonomous stage definitely requires a ton more practice and it's very it's pretty much like you have to devote a lot of time to this particular sport or activity so um yeah it, it can be quite time consuming and so a lot of people don't have the time for this unless they are at an elite level of sport so in this stage motor skills are quite automatic and um, this results in performance being at a very high level and being very consistent Practice in this stage should be highly unpredictable and varied, simulating game-like situations and conditions as much as possible. Um, they're definitely able to recognise their own mistakes. They might have a coach, but this coach is probably more about helping them design tactics for the real game scenario as opposed to like developing their swing, per se. So, yeah. Um, here is just a little table evaluating the impact of different social culture factors and how they can vary depending on the stage of learning. Um, so we've got social culture factor, family dynamics. Um, this can affect each of the stages of learning. So in the cognitive stage, you know, this may be really important because having really encouraging parents or siblings who play a particular sport, they kind of cause you, propel you toward playing that same sport as well. In the associative stage, it's often really important that family members can provide transport to training or matches and or someone to practice with, as well as encouragement um, you know, during games and things. And in the autonomous stage, family dynamics are kind of less important and less likely to have a huge influence in this stage. 
but obviously, you know, having a good relationship with your parents and having them come to your sporting games and things is still um, a good thing. Um, so we've got two main types of coaching which we do need to know about. We've got directing and strengths-based coaching. So direct is more of an odd school style of coaching. Generally, when using direct coaching, the learner doesn't have to do much thinking or make decisions for themselves. Um, it's really like the coach telling you exactly what to do, and you kind of just do that. It's kind of like the old school method of coaching. So things such as like doing 50 tennis serves in a row um, is a method of you know direct coaching. We've also got constraints-based coaching, which is much more adaptive than direct coaching, and modifies tasks due to individual environmental and task constraints. And so coaches kind of guide the training rather than run it. They kind of recognize how a particular um, individual learns or what's best for them and kind of guides them in that direction and maybe has some kind of game-like scenarios and things, but it really allows the individual to tailor their learning. Practices are often highly variable, lots of different tasks being performed and constraints are often modified. And this helps to increase the learning of a skill. In terms of amount of practice, generally more is better, um, apart from like when someone becomes fatigued. During the cognitive stage of learning, improvements will occur quickly, while in the associated and respondent stages, improvement will be more gradual. So we've got different methods and um, variabilities, I guess, of practice. So in terms of distribution, we've got shorter, more frequent training sessions in terms of distributed practice. And this is better for learning and use at the elite level. So it's like you might have a short one hour session as opposed to one big slab of three hours of sport a week. Like I, like for example, if you only have one, you know, piano lesson per week, you might have one big two hour lesson or three hour lesson, which is quite a big slog, right? Um, whereas if you perhaps are an elite level, you might do you know, one hour practice three or four times a week. And so you do get the same amount perhaps or even more maybe, but it's more spread out and that's likely to result in fatigue or tiredness. Um, so you can see here that MAST, which is the longer, less frequent session, is more likely to result in fatigue and is generally used at a low for amateur level. In terms of variability of practice, we've got blocked and random. So blocked involves practice in the same school repeatedly for a period of time without performing any other skills, like you know doing 50 chips in a row for golf. Um, in terms of random, it's performing a number of different skills together, which is better suited to learners in the associative autonomous stages, kind of like when you're getting a bit better. And it can be, it's believed to increase the learning of skills, so it kind of simulates a real game scenario better, and that allows you to kind of adapt to changes very quickly. So we've got a few types of feedback. So feedback's any sort of information that an individual gathers or receives about their performance on a specific task. And so intrinsic is when the individual uses their own senses to judge their performance. So for example, a cricket player may feel the ball come off the middle of the bat and see it race away to the boundary. Um, it's kind of like viewing it, I guess. Um, it's like when you hit, like, drive a ball in golf and you hit it and you feel the noise it makes. And it's like a really satisfying noise and you know um, that you've done well. This is intrinsic. Um, it's often proprioceptive too. Augmented feedback, on the other hand, is external, and it generally comes from someone like a coach, and it can be split into two categories, so knowledge of results and knowledge of performance. So knowledge of results refers to feedback about the outcome of a particular task. For example, for a player trying to learn to pitch accurately in baseball, the coach could give feedback on how close they were to a target. Whereas knowledge of performance is more about... Oops, I don't know why that's written like that. Something happened to my slides. I don't know why it's like that, guys. Sorry. It's extremely annoying because they were all fine before and now they're not. Um, anyway, so knowledge of performance refers to the characteristics of a task um, rather than the specific outcome. So things like, you know, your angle is a bit high during your pitch there. So more about particular traits and things observed than just, yeah, you got a goal. got frequency of feedback, so for learners in the cognitive beginner stage, they will need a lot of feedback because they probably won't be able to identify their own errors and correct them. As learners move into the associative and autonomous stages, they kind of get better at identifying their errors and can correct them themselves. And so basically, as they kind of move through these stages of learning, we need less and less feedback. So this is a bit of some like tips um, to go through before 
before the exam, making sure that you do identify the different types of skills, know a few simple examples of each category that you can easily name. Um, I know we didn't spend a lot of detail ask, like looking at how, I don't know, time can influence, um, you know, cognitive associative and autonomous stages of learning, but try and go through all those dot points I had, like family dynamics, time, values, resources, stuff like that, and see how they can influence each level of learning. Maybe write it out in like a table or something, um, because they need to be really good practice in the exam. Now the steps to qualitative movement analysis, I just think of PO, P-O-E-E, -E, um, and you can generally think about each step fairly logically. Identify different factors at different stages of learning. Um, practice using scenarios, identify type of coaching and practice feedback that's happening, and be aware of the advantages and disadvantages of each type of coaching and practice methods. So, I know we've only been here for like, oh, it's been nearly 30 minutes now. I'm just going to quickly go and get some more water because I've run out before we get into biomechanics because it is a pretty big area of study. So, I'll be really quick, guys. Just give me a second. Okay, hopefully you guys can see me. I got some more water. So um, we should be good to move on to biomechanics now, which is a pretty heavy area of study. Um, yeah, there's not much to say about this. It is a very heavy area of study. I have got some mnemonics, which I think are quite helpful. And I've had some students reach out and say, yes, they are really helpful, even if they are a bit weird. Um, so hopefully these will help you out, but the best thing I can recommend here is just making flashcards. You guys get these slides as like PDFs, I think, so you can literally just copy and paste each, you know, definition and the keyword into like a flashcards maker online. Like you could literally Google or look up flashcards maker. You can just get one online and print it out and then have flashcards, like physical flashcards. Um, or you can use apps like Anki or Quizlet. I know Quizlet's paid now, which is very annoying, but other apps. Um, I remember Chegg used to have a really good flashcards app that you can use. So, yeah, I know it's quite time consuming, but making flashcards like, is quite a bit of a slog in the short term, but in the long term will help you recall stuff very well. So, I recommend it. Um, I know it's pretty boring though doing it. But, yeah. Okay. Biomechanics, heavy topic, I don't know anyone who does enjoy it, but hopefully you can kind of change your view on it and see that it's quite predictable in the exam. Um, so you don't actually have to do any real exams, or any, sorry, real, you don't have to do a real exam, you don't have to do any real calculations in the exam, because you don't get a calculator, but you do have to do things with some small calculations, and you have to have a lot of a theoretical understanding of these biomechanic concepts. So... One of the main definitions is the word force, and so forces are when one object acts on another object, so a push or a pull force, and so these are measured in newtons, and so forces will generally change the motion of an object, either speeding it up, slowing it down, or changing its direction. I know there's a lot of writing here, and I'm sorry, but hopefully this does make sense. 
um, this is just an example, but mass is measured in kilograms. For example, you might have a body mass of about 65 kilograms. And so weight is a force acting on the object due to gravity and is measured in newtons. So weight is equals mass times the acceleration of gravity. Um, so your mass is always going to be, say for example, your 65 kilograms, it's always going to be 65 kilos. On Earth, your weight is going to be 65 times um, the acceleration of gravity, okay? So if you go into Mars, acceleration of gravity might change, and so therefore your weight will be different. It just kind of bothers me that, like, if you get on the scale and weigh yourself, your weight is given in kilograms, because that's not your weight. That's, I mean, like, your weight should be measured in newtons. It should say how many newtons you are, whereas your mass is measured in kilograms. Would that be influence of gravity? So that's just something to keep in mind that you must know, okay? Okay, we've got Newton's three laws in motion here. So we've got three laws of linear motion. And the first law in um, Newton's special of motion, it states that an object at rest or in motion remains at rest or in motion unless acted upon by an external unbalanced force. I know it's not what's written here, but that's one that I prefer to use. Um, this one is also fine if you want to use that instead. Um, this is also known as the law of inertia, but be aware that you can't just write the law of inertia on your exam. You have to actually write an object at rest, or emotional remain at rest, or emotional it's acted upon by an external imbalance force, or whatever your preferred definition is. Maybe something that your teachers told you. Okay? So make sure that you do write out the whole thing, not just the law of inertia. Newton's second law of motion is quite a long one, but I find it a lot simpler just to write force equals mass times acceleration, and then just kind of suss out what that means from that equation. So what it means is that the more mass we have in an object, the more force is required to accelerate it, okay? So increasing the mass means increasing the force required to accelerate it. Which pretty much makes sense. So if you write out the formula and just try and figure out what's going on in the formula, you figured out the second law of motion. For Newton's third law, it states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's not always easy to see, but we do have some examples. So when you, you know, hit a tennis ball with a tennis racket, the racket has an impact on the ball. But the ball also has an equal and opposite reaction on the racket. But because the ball's got a smaller mass and weight, it doesn't you can't really observe that effect on the ball. Another really wild um, example of this is that you know you jump on the earth, you exert a force on the earth. The earth also exerts a force on you. Um, so like it's hard to tell that like gravity you exert. Like, the Earth exerts gravity on you, and you exert a force, a force on the Earth. Because you're so tiny compared to how large the Earth is, you can't really see how you're, like, impacting the Earth. Another one, like, a more basic example is, if you get on a boat, and you, like, step off the boat, you'll go forwards, and the boat will go backwards, right? Um, like, you're both going opposite directions. You're pushing off, you're going opposite directions. You're having an equal and opposite reaction on each other, Okay. I know more definitions and it's not really fun, but really just getting these down is really, really good. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm like wheezing. I don't know why. <coughs> Inertia. <coughs> this is a tendency for an object to resist any changes to its state of motion. Basically, if an object is at rest, it will stay at rest, and if it's moving, it will keep moving. Unless acted upon by an external unbalanced force. <coughs> Sorry guys, um, so something's at a higher mass, it will have a higher inertia, okay? So 100 kilogram weight versus 2 kilogram weight. This 100 kilogram weight will have a higher inertia. Momentum is the amount of motion that a moving object has, and it's quite tricky to define. This is just something you kind of have to, like, using this definition is fine. Um, you do have to know this formula though, so momentum is equal to mass times velocity, and this is written as P equals M times V. Recall that velocity is due to displacement over time. Whereas um, speed is distance over time. Uh, so, yeah, momentum is written as P because M times V. Momentum is measured in kilograms per meter second. So, imagine two objects have the same velocity. The one with the greater mass will have the most momentum. And it's the same with two objects with the same mass. The one with the greatest velocity will have the most momentum. Okay? Something to note is that momentum is conserved in a collision. <clears throat> so, when there are no external forces acting in a collision, momentum will always be conserved. What this means is that the total net momentum before the collision is equal to the total net momentum after the collision, okay?
just explaining this a bit further is if we look at this example, we've got this one rugby player here whose um, momentum is 100 kilograms in meters per second, and the player on the right has a momentum of 80 kilograms in meters per second. This guy obviously has a greater momentum, and so what it means is that when they collide, they're actually going to collide and they're going to keep traveling in this direction because this guy has the increased momentum. So net momentum is equal to 100 to 80, 20 kilograms in meters per second to the right. Because we know that displacement has, um, it's a vector, it has um, direction, and so it will have direction in this situation because it's referring to um, momentum, which is mass times velocity, and velocity is due to displacement over time. Um, something else to note is you can modify your momentum by increasing your mass. So if you put on like a big heavy belt, like a weighted belt or something, you could increase your momentum. You can also increase it by improving your velocity or increasing it. So if you increase your velocity, then as a result of that, you could increase your momentum. So if this guy was just standing still, he might have a greater mass than this guy. But if this guy, you know, has, is, weighs less, but is moving faster, he can actually topple this guy over. Or like cause the collision to travel in the leftward direction. Uh, we've got another concept here called the summation in momentum, which refers to an object being struck with maximal velocity when the object is to hit it as far as possible. Um, so momentum is generated through the body in a sequential fashion, beginning with the body parts close to the center of gravity, which is the chest, and then transferring to the other parts of the body, such as the arms, wrist, fingers, and extremities. So impulse is a change in momentum of an object, um, and to change this momentum, a force needs to be applied to an object over a period of time, and so impulse is equal to force times time. So imagine you're catching a ball that's coming at you quite quickly. When you catch it, you naturally move your hands backward to cushion the ball. And what this is doing is increasing the time of which the force is applied, which therefore decreases the force of the ball on your hands. So something else which does also increase this is, um, oops, we didn't have it there, is when you wear a glove in like baseball or softball, that also like cushions the ball and it increases the time of which that force is being applied to your ball. The reason, so to your hands, and the reason that this is important is you can actually reduce injury risk. So if it hits you very quickly in, in a short amount of time, all that force is transferred to you very quickly, right? It can be a bit violent, it can hurt you. But if you increase the time of which it's transferred by like, you know, following back with the ball and having a glove or something like that, this actually uh, reduces the amount of, um, well, it increases the amount of time of which that force is applied, and so it decreases the chance of injury, okay? Nearly an hour through. So, so far we've looked at linear or straight line motion, and now we're going to look at angular motion. And so it's very similar to the linear motion, but you'll see that some of the definitions have changed a bit. So we use the angular momentum of an object to remain constant was acted upon by an external torque instead of force. And so you can notice that we might actually just replace the word force pretty often with torque in the rotational or angular motion instead. And so torque is simply a rotational force, kind of like a twist. So Newton's second law is a torque applied to an object will cause a change in the angular momentum of the object that's proportional to the size of the torque and inversely proportional to the moment of inertia the object has. This is a really important concept, moment of inertia, and it does come up very frequently in the exam. Like nearly every year you get a moment of inertia question. And so moment of inertia is the tendency of an object to resist changes to its rotation. And so it's equal to mass times radius squared. I just think more equals Mr. squared, which doesn't really make sense, but it helps me remember the formula. Um, yes, yeah, so moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared. An object whose mass is close to the center will be much easier to rotate because it has a lower moment of inertia than an object whose mass is spread far away. So junior players often use smaller equipment because um, it's easier to rotate due to the lower moment of inertia. So a smaller golf club, smaller bat, smaller tennis racket. All these have a smaller radius. Therefore, if their radius is decreased and their mass is decreased as well, they actually decrease the moment of inertia and make it easier to change its rotation. Okay, this is a really important formula. Um, so the first thing I wanted you guys to take away from this is a tenant accounts are really great. You should make one because it's free and wonderful. The second thing you should take away is this because it comes up pretty often. So we've got our third law of motion. So for every torque, there's an equal and opposite torque. Cool. Moving on from that, we've got angular momentum. So recall that momentum is the amount of motion an object has. 
angular momentum is the amount of angular motion that an object has, and it's always conserved. And so angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times by angular velocity. But we already know, we just discussed moment of inertia, and moment of inertia has its own formula. So if we just, you know, highlight this, this was supposed to be like square brackets, I don't know what we did. Do you remember what moment of inertia is? So, moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared. So, something to note is that angular momentum is conserved. What this means is that if in its formula, if one part goes up, the other must go down, because it must remain at the same level, okay? Overall, it's conserved. I think it's like a seesaw. A seesaw can't get, like, higher than the height it can go, right? You can't just put the seesaw getting all the way up here when it only goes to here. That was a bad explanation. Hopefully that makes sense so far. So conserved, I think, is like a seesaw. If one side goes up of the seesaw, the other side must go down. If someone's side goes up, the other side must go down. That's what conservation means. Moment of inertia is not conserved. If I increase my mass, it doesn't mean my radius will decrease. My radius could also increase, okay? So moment of inertia is not conserved, meaning I can modify both parts of the equation at the same time. Angular momentum is conserved, meaning you can't modify both parts at the same time. If you modify one part, the other part will be affected in a seesaw type way, okay? So that's what conservation is. Conservation is the seesaw. One side goes up, the other side goes down. Um... So, we've got the formula. Angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times angular velocity. And we've got moment of inertia equal to uh, mass times radius squared. And we can actually, um, what we can do is manipulate this equation however we want. So, we can see in the diagram here on the right, we've got a diver. Um, if we look at A, this diver is going to be spinning really fast. And I'll explain why in a second. If we look at B, the divers get a bit of a slower velocity. If we look at C, that's a... I mean, they might come up when they dive in, but if we just think of someone flopping in the water with their body all outstretched like that, it's going to be a bit of an unpleasant type of image. Like, I would imagine a belly flop, right? Like a really heavy, slow-motion belly flop, you know? Um, like, you can literally imagine them falling in a slow motion. And the reason you can see this is because they actually are falling in a slower way than this faster angular velocity. You can actually speed up um, how fast you spin if you tuck up small. So we're going to examine this. Um, so say, for instance, a diver is diving up the high board and they want to do 10 somersaults in the air. Forget this, not do 10, let's do 5. They want to do 10 somersaults in the air. Their problem is they only keep getting three. They want to get to five and they, they keep getting to three only. And so what they need to do is increase their speed at which they like spin through the air, right? So we know what speed which you spin through the air is because this is angular velocity. That's like the, the velocity at which you move in an angular way or a rotational motion way, right? So... We know angular momentum is conserved, meaning if one thing goes up, the other must go down. So if we say we want to increase this, what we must do is have this decrease. And how can we decrease the moment of inertia? Like, I can't just say I want to be faster. We have to change things. So what we can change is moment of inertia. We know that if we decrease moment of inertia, angular velocity will go up. So decreasing moment of inertia means we can decrease our mass and our radius, or our radius. We can decrease one or the other, or both. So, you can decrease our mass, um, like if you're wearing ankle weights or something, you can just take them off, or you can lose actual weight. Obviously, it's not like a very quick, you know, quick fix, so that's a bit harder to manipulate. But, radius is really easy, because if I stretch my arms out wide like this, my radius is really wide, right? Whereas if I curl up small, my radius has gotten a lot smaller. And so, radius is something you can really rapidly change. And so, if you're a diver, and you're finding it hard to, like, get to five somersaults, you can think, okay, I want to increase my angular velocity, because if I increase my angular velocity, I can spin faster and get more somersaults in before I hit the water. In order to increase my angular velocity, I can decrease my moment of inertia. And the way I can do this is either by you know, losing any added weight or mass, or I can decrease my radius by tucking in small. Okay? And as a result of this, decreasing one of these or both of these will decrease your moment of inertia, 
And if that decreases on the seesaw, your other side must go up. Therefore, your angular velocity must speed or get faster and improve and get higher. Because overall angular momentum is conserved. By the same token, if you wanted to actually decrease your angular velocity, what you could do is stretch out your arms wide and stretch out your body wide and increase your radius. Because increasing your radius or even gaining weight, like putting on an ankle weight or something, this will actually increase the wave of inertia and decrease your angular velocity. So you won't get as many spins in. Okay? So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. I know it is a bit of a complex topic, but um, hopefully that did kind of convey some things to you, some key points that you can take away, because it does come up in the exam. I recommend like you know highlighting the slide, having a look at it, reading through it, and trying to have a think through the problem again, because you're even just rewatching this lecture, because it can be quite difficult. And it does come up pretty often, like nearly every year, I think, this question. Like, not this question exactly, but a very, you know, similar style and probably a question that asks about angular velocity. So, yeah, definitely check that out. I will rewatch this. Okay, good work, guys. Let's move on. Um, so, it's funny that we've already talked about velocity and speed, but I mentioned speed is distance over time and velocity is displacement over time. By the way, if you had questions about that previous question, pop them in the chat right now so I can address them before we move on. Um, so distance and displacement are kind of measurement type things. So distance, distance is how far an object's traveled following the path it's taken. This is your distance. So obviously it's quite a long path. Here's your displacement, just point A to point B. Instead of going along this path, you just draw a straight line. And also displacement has direction because it's a vector. So I know it's not a straight line, but imagine it is. This displacement is obviously a lot shorter than this distance. Uh, by the same token, if you go, um, sorry, if we start here, we go all the way up here, you know, into 10 kilometers of running or something, and get back to where we start, our distance is 10 kilometers, whereas our displacement is zero, because we're right back at the start, okay? Um, we already discussed speed and velocity. We've got acceleration, which is a change in velocity over a period of time. Zero acceleration does not mean no movement. So acceleration is equal to change in velocity over change in time. So if I'm not accelerating, there are two things which could be happening. I could either just be not accelerating, as in I could just be like, that was a bad answer. I am not accelerating, but I could either be stationary, as in I'm not moving, therefore I'm not accelerating, or I could be moving at a constant pace, and therefore I am moving at a constant pace, but not accelerating, okay? Okay, now we'll jump back into angular motion. And so this is caused by an eccentric force acting on an object, a force that doesn't act through the center of gravity on an object. Every year I think, oh, I need to have a tennis ball. And I don't, I do have this. My hamster ball. Um, so we have a circular ball as shown. If we have an eccentric force acting on the bottom left of the ball here, there, there's our weird force acting on it. It will cause the ball to rotate clockwise. How much it rotates will depend on the size of the force and the size of the lever arm. So the lever arm is a distance from the center of gravity to this force. That's the lever arm. So if the lever arm is wider, we'll have a more eccentric force acting on it. Or like I think if like in English, right? If we say someone's eccentric, it's kinda like, yeah, they're kinda weird, you know. Eccentric's like a polite word for weird. And I think if this is like a weird force. Um like when you hit the ball of kilter, it spirals out weirdly, as opposed to like a nice neat spiral. So, yeah, I just think of this eccentric force being a weird force, which causes the violent spiraling of the ball. Okay, so if we hit the ball right, in the, this is so convenient. Go straight line through the middle. If we hit it in the middle, it's going to be fine. It's just going to roll through the air very smoothly, right? Whereas if we roll, like hit it here, sort of off the center, it's going to spiral out in a strange way, right? In an unusual way. Whereas if we hit it even further out, it will spiral out even more erratically. So the greater the lever arm, the greater the torque or rotation. So if we hit it, you know, here it's gonna spin, if we hit it here it's gonna spin a bit more. And if we hit it at the very edge, like have a greater lever arm here, it's gonna be a much more violent rotation. Okay? So the greater the torque. So hopefully that makes sense. I know it's a bit difficult, but um yeah, put any questions in the chat if you do have any. Whew, nearly done with this, surely. Okay, this is the harder part. Um, I didn't enjoy biomechanics in high school. I 
but it was so difficult and so hard and I just didn't enjoy it. And now I feel like I get it and I like understand it a lot better now. Um, it happens when you do three years of it. But yeah, it definitely, like just practicing it and trying to work through the situations in your head is a good way of like revising it. Okay, so on to angular distance and displacement. So angular distance and displacement works in a very similar way to linear distance and displacement. So if a gymnast is swinging around a bar, if they do two full rotations, their distance would be three times three, sorry, two times 360 degrees, which is 720 degrees, but their displacement would be zero degrees, as their starting position is the same as their final position. Angular speed and velocity is the total distance covered by, um, divided by the time taken. So another formula which you need to re um, remember, but you don't need to use it exactly, you just need to understand it. Um, so we can see here that linear velocity is equal to angular velocity times radius of rotation. So your angular velocity can actually influence your linear velocity and your radius rotation can also influence your linear velocity. So that's something you just need to understand. So if you imagine a golfer hitting a club, in order to increase the linear velocity of the ball, they could increase their radius of rotation. So if you want to hit the ball further when you're playing golf, right? So you've got your golf club. If you want to hit the ball further, you can like, if you hit it and it's just, you don't have much of a backswing, you're not increasing your angular velocity, right? You're just hitting it small. But if you do increase your angular velocity and radius of rotation, so angular velocity is how fast you hit it. If you hit it faster and you increase your radius of rotation by having more of a backswing, you can increase your radius of rotation there. Um, and you can actually hit further. Same thing as if you get like a longer club, then you have an increased radius of rotation because you can go further. That radius is longer because that club is longer. So you can hit further. And so drivers are the golf club you use when you like hit off the tee, right? So drivers are longer than irons because if you have a driver, the driver's longer than iron because you want to hit it further. You want to hit straight off the tee to get as close as possible um, to the hole, right? So a driver will help you hit it far and long because it is quite a long club and it has and increase radius of rotation. And if you apply the same velocity to that, you can actually increase the overall linear velocity and get it to go further, okay? It's quite complex, so maybe take a second to like digest that, because I know it is quite heavy content. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna check how many slides we have, because it's giving me, we've been doing this quite a while now. Um, nearly an hour and we've got 102 slides. Okay, we're going to breeze through this a bit faster. Projectile motion, hopefully you guys understand that there are three components, horizontal component, sorry, two components, horizontal and vertical component. I've written down the main influences here. We've also got three factors that affect projectile motion, angle of release, speed of release, and height of release. So angle of release is the angle at which you release it. Generally things which, you know, if you're flat on the ground, land flat on the ground. 45 degrees is a good angle for us to throw it. A greater speed of release means you can throw it further, and a greater height of release um, can influence the projectile. Um, so height of release is the height from which the projectile is launched in comparison to where it lands or is stopped. So if the height of release is zero, then the optimal angle of release is 45 degrees. If you're launching the projectile from above where it will land, it's less than 45 degrees. That's the optimal angle. Optimal angle is less than 45 degrees. Whereas if you want to throw something up, you've got to throw higher, so more than 45 degrees, okay? Okay, levers, our favourite part. And I used to say that kind of sarcastically when I was in high school, but now I mean it because I have a really good mnemonic for levers. I think it's a good mnemonic and hopefully it will help you. I know it is a bit strange, but if it does help you, let me know. Um, I do say it every year. Um, and I do get students tell me later on, like, oh, that really helped me, even if it is a bit strange. <coughs> Need a drink. So, a lever is a rigid bar that rotates around an axis to exert a force on another object. All levers consist of an axis, a force, and a resistance. Your teacher might use other words. Um, I don't use those. I prefer using these terms. Vika approves both sets of terms. But this is the one I'm going to use. So we'll have some diagrams in a minute. 
We've got three types of levers, which you do have to memorize. First, second, and third class levers. Um, kind of like a little hack for the exam. If you're totally stuck, third class levers are the most common. So if you get given a picture and it's like, what type of lever is this? The best bet is just to go with a third class lever. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we're going to remember these three types of levers. I don't know what's going on with this picture here. It's very strange. Okay, so I've just like given you the slide and you're probably annoyed because it's like we're going to go through levers and I just haven't explained these, but I'll explain them on the next slide and how to remember them. Okay, so we're going to slide after this. Here is um, a lever. So we've got force, axis, and resistance. Force, axis, which is like the seesaw pivot point, and the resistance. And they've got different terms here, which are both accepted by Vika, but I prefer to use axis, resistance, force. So as I mentioned, there were three types of levers, first, second, and third class levers. And the difference between them is where the axis, resistance, and force are located. And the most common type of lever found in the body are the third class levers. Anyway, you must remember these three levers. You must remember how they're arranged. And you must remember an example for each one. So I have you covered for that, mostly. So I want you to think of a race. Um, think of your local athletics track. Like when I was in high school, I remember the athletics track my school used to go to. And it was like red and it was a really good track. It was really nice to run on. Um, yeah, it was a really nice track. And so every time I think of this, I always think of that track. So imagine that track. Now imagine there were three people running a race, okay? Maybe they're doing the 400 meter event, okay? That's my favorite one, 400 meter. They're all running the 400 meter event. In first place, we have someone who is far ahead of everyone else, okay? They are far ahead of everyone else. I know that's not very good English, but anyway, it makes sense. You can think of it in your head. They are way ahead of everyone else, right? Far ahead. So first class is far ahead. First class, far ahead. So force, Axis resistance. You can see his axis in the middle. Force, axis resistance. Second place is being chased by a dog. So I think of if you've got a pet dog, imagine your pet dog yapping at someone's heels. Just like yapping, 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 trying to bite their heels. And so they're like running on their tiptoes and trying to get away from the dog and screaming. So second place is being chased by a dog that's yapping at the heels, going, oof, oof, oof. So you know, like in Tin Tin comics and stuff, sometimes the dogs say, oof. Or in other cartoons and things. So there's no reason that R is a lot smaller than the, than the same size. Arf. Second class is Arf. You can see here, axis resistance force. It doesn't matter which order you put it, you put axis resistance force. I mean, the ordering doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter which direction you go from. So it can either be axis resistance force or axis resistance force. Just as long as you can see this directionality. Okay. Okay, finally we've got third class. Third class is after everyone else. Not much to say, they're after. A F T E <coughs> After everyone else. Okay, so now we've got our three types of levers. The first place is far ahead of everyone. F A R, far ahead. Second place is being chased by a dog going arf and yapping at their heels. And third place is after everyone else. You will see some examples relating to all of these. Um, and so, uh, the, the main example of first class lever in the human body is when you nod your head. It's like this nodding action is a first class lever. You've got force, axis, and resistance kind of in your head and neck area. You don't need to know too much about it, just know that example. Second place, sorry, second class lever, this involves like, um, an example of this is standing on your tiptoes. That's why I said the dog's yapping at your heels. That's why you're running on your toes, because the dog's yapping at your heels. So if you put your feet flat on the ground, and then you raise your feet and stand on your tiptoes, that's a second class lever. Okay, you've got your axis, which is the pivot point of your foot in the ground. 
resistance, and then force, which is the weight of your body. So you're lifting pretty much the entire weight of your body on your tiptoes. And so a second class lever is pretty much any kind of lever system, which allows you to move quite a heavy force with relatively little effort. And so an example of another second, or another example of a second class lever is a wheelbarrow. Like if I asked you to carry like 15 bricks at once, that's pretty heavy, right? Like if I asked you to pick up a whole wheelbarrow, carry them, it'd be pretty heavy. But by using a second class lever, a wheelbarrow, we can actually like lift this relatively heavy force quite easily. And so, you know, the wheel, the wheelbarrow is at access point, you've got the resistance, which is that um, weight in the middle and then the force. So, yeah, second class lever is lifting something very heavy with relatively little force. Like when you stand on tiptoes, you're lifting your entire body by standing on tiptoes. So you're using access, resistance, and force. Arf. Our third class lever is after everyone else. An example of that is pretty much most other examples. We've got the bicep curl, the one. Um, we've got, you know, swinging a bat. Kicking a ball. If you can kind of imagine a swinging motion or like an arc of rotation, it's going to be a third class lever. So, for example, with a bicep curl, you know when you're in like year seven or eight and you do like angles and you've got to like identify obtuse angles? If you can identify an obtuse angle in any of these situations, it's going to be a third class lever. So, if you think of the bicep curl with the arm, you can see the obtuse angle here. If you're thinking of like a golfer swinging it back, if you draw the line that like golf club makes, you can draw an obtuse angle there, like another arc of rotation. If you're like throwing a ball, once again another obtuse angle here, you can draw another arc of rotation. Or if you're kicking the ball with your leg, right? Kicking with your leg, you can draw another arc of rotation there. Once again, another obtuse angle. So you can draw that arc of rotation. So anytime you can draw an arc of rotation, it's going to be a third class lever. And like because most sporting examples we discuss with third class levers, it's your best bet to go with a third class lever. Okay, so I've asked you to memorize these things. You might be like, well, I already know them. I don't need to memorize this mnemonic. Um, that's fine. But it is still required because, um, wait, let me just make sure we've covered all this. We've covered, oh, we have to cover this bit. Because of force arm resistance arm. That's why it's important. So we can see here this is our axis and this is our force. This is our resistance. The force arm is the space from the axis to the force. And the resistance arm is the space from the axis to the resistance. If, so if I draw that three lever types now. Far, of, and after. Um, if we look at this, the force arm and the resistance arm <clears throat> look to be quite even. The problem with the first class lever is we can't actually see how far they are. So force is here, axis is here, resistance could be right here. Which is why we generally ignore the first class lever in these questions, and Vika doesn't tend to ask about it. So that's good, we don't have to worry too much about that. In terms of the second and third class levers though, there's always going to be something which is close to the axis, something further to the axis. You can see here the resistance arm is longer than the force arm in the second class lever, whereas in the third class lever, the force arm is shorter than the resistance arm. Um, you actually need to be able to calculate this by putting in um, like force arm over resistance arm. Okay, so this is an important formula. I wonder if I have it written down on the slides. Let me just make sure I do have it. Um, I don't think I do. I'm wondering if I get a screenshot and just put it really quickly. And then I can paste it on the slides. Uh, no, I don't have a picture here. That's okay. I would just find out mechanical advantage. So mechanical advantage is mechanical advantage is equal to force arm over resistance arm. And if something has a greater mechanical advantage, so for example, the second class lever has more force arm over resistance arm, it has got a mechanical advantage. And therefore it's good at lifting heavy stuff with like quite a lot of ease or little effort. 
Whereas if something has a mechanical disadvantage, such as the third class lever, which has a longer resistance than force, it's actually going to be really bad with the heavy things. Like, it's not very... Swinging around like this isn't going to help you pick up a golf club or pick up a brick or something. But what it does do is it gives us an increased range of motion. And so this increased range of motion can actually increase our angular, so our radius of rotation. And if we maintain the same angular velocity, then we can actually increase our linear velocity. Because remember, linear velocity was due to angular velocity times by our radius of rotation. So you can see here that by increasing our radius of rotation, by using a third class lever, we know this has a mechanical disadvantage. And while this mechanical disadvantage does not give us the ability to actually lift something heavy, it does allow us to have this increased range of motion. And this increased range of motion allows us to increase radius of rotation and therefore increase our linear velocity. Okay? This is why having a third class lever is really useful for things such as hitting a ball or kicking a ball or, you know, swinging a bat, stuff like that. Okay? Okay, I think that was pretty heavy. Um, let me just see how many slides we're at now. So we'll have to get a bit of... We've got 15 minutes left. Okay, that's great. So I pretty much explained all of that. We're about a third of the way in. Um, I've already gone through all of this, so I pretty much explained all of that. It's just there in a written format. Do go back to memorize those different types of lever systems. I know you may not like my four cylinder system. Um, yeah, like my mnemonic with the dog and the athletics nerd. But if it does help you out, I'm glad because I just had so much trouble with this in high school and I really needed something like that. Like my mind works in a very visual way. And yeah, let me know if that helps you out. Okay, a few more terms. I'm not really gonna go through them too much. It's pretty much explanatory. The italicized word here is what you need to memorize. So do, do that please. Um, and we've also got some things which can affect stability and balance. So, center of gravity, place of support, and line of gravity. So, once again, the definitions are here. Um, yeah. I know biomechanics is pretty full on, but don't panic and practice using questions as much as possible. So, go through the VCA sample exam questions and the 2019 exam, as well as all the other exams. Um, we've got tons of practice exams. The one thing which is really difficult about uni is we don't get as many practice exams, if any at all. So it's really important. Like, you guys have practice exams. We could give you like 20 years worth of practice exams. And I know the study designs change, but you do have quite a lot of questions which overlap with each study design. So practicing using them is the best way to succeed in UC, I would say. So keep using them. Um, yeah, try and do as many exams as you can. Okay, guys? Like, that's the best thing you can do. Basically, memorize common answers to biomechanics questions. So that gymnast tucking in the air one is a very similar one. We might get a diver. As long as you understand the theory behind it and are able to explain it, you should be fine for those questions. I know there's three different types of levers, and memorize an easy example for each. And hopefully, my mnemonic helped you there, so you guys have that covered already. So, yeah. And then I've given you this slide deck, which has that example with the gymnast or the diver swimming, uh, swimming? swinging through the air or spinning through the air. So it's a really good example and very applicable to the exam. Okay, moving on to energy systems, which I really enjoy. Um, I'm kind of a bio nerd, so I did do biology in high school. I did really love that. And then I did biomed degree, which is a lot of biology and chemistry, and then now I'm doing medicine, which is more biology and chemistry. So I really do enjoy this. So hopefully you guys also enjoy it. Um, okay, so we've got adenosine triphosphate. This is the source of energy for muscular contraction. So we think of energy, you might think of kilojoules or whatever, but we eat food and we digest it. And once it's in our bodies, it's kind of converted to this form called ATP. And ATP is like the energy currency of our bodies. Okay, so it's the only source of energy for muscular contractions. And so we kind of need ATP for tons and tons of processes in the body. So like your nerves use ATP. Um, neurotransmitters require ATP. Protein channels require ATP. Moving things from one part of the cell to another can require ATP. Moving things throughout the body can require ATP. But ATP is just completely essential, and it's really important that we do have tons of it in store. 
So it's the only source of energy for muscular contraction. And other fuels that we look at, such as glycogen and triglycerides, they allow ATP to be built up from ADP. So if you're doing biology, it's taking you a really long time to understand or recognize, like an embarrassingly long time. But you know how you look at your nucleotide bases in biology? Like pretty much DNA and RNA are made up of these four nucleotide bases. And one of them is named adenosine. And this is the same adenosine as in your DNA. And it's kind of got a similar structure to your DNA. Like you've got the phosphate here, um, the three phosphates. And so if you attach one adenosine to three phosphates, you get energy, which is really cool. Um, and so what happens, if you do chemistry, you would know that energy is stored in bonds, right? So when we break this bond, we actually liberate the energy contained within it. And that energy, when we're breaking that bond, gives us the energy to contract our muscles, okay? And we can actually, so ATP is triphosphate, three phosphates, and ADP is diphosphates, two phosphates. So if we go from ADP to ATP, we actually rebuild an adiphosphate or bind it back together. And then ATP can be snapped down to ADP, and we end up with a diphosphate, but we release that energy. We can actually go down even further to monophosphate, but we don't really discuss that in PE. So we'll go through the three energy systems, and um, they all require some sort of fuel to produce ATP. And so one of those fuels is called phosphocreatine, or PC. You might call it creatine phosphate. I say PC. And I also say ATP-PC system, but whatever you say, if it's ATP-CP, that's also fine. So around 10-15 seconds worth of PC can be stored at the muscles. <coughs> Carbohydrates are the body's preferred fuel during exercise. They're breaking down and stored as glycogen or glucose. Um, they're the preferred fuel source over fat because they don't require oxygen to produce the same amount of energy. Like You don't need to use oxygen to break down glycogen. But you can as well. So glycogen or carbs are pretty variable. So yes, we can use oxygen or no, we can just like not use oxygen, that's fine. Fats are the body's preferred fuel at rest and they are stored as triglycerides. And then we've got protein, which is only used as a fuel for energy production in extreme circumstances. Like when all fats in your body and all carbs have been completely depleted. So we don't really discuss them very much in PE because it's going to be a really extreme scenario in which you have to use fats. Not fats, sorry, proteins. Um, fats are fine. We often use fats. We're using fats right now, actually, because you're probably sitting down watching this and you're getting enough oxygen that you can actually break down the fats and use them. Okay, this is a pretty intense looking slide, so we'll go through it. Um, the ATP PC system is an anaerobic energy system, meaning it doesn't need oxygen and it uses phosphocreatine as a fuel. This is a chemical fuel, you can't just like eat phosphocreatine and get it, so make sure you know that it's a the chemical fuel. Um, when this phosphocreatine is broken down to phosphate and creatinine, so creatine, this produces energy that allows ADP to be rebuilt into ATP, giving it the potential to produce energy to move it again. <clears throat> so you can see we've got phosphocreatine, we break it down to phosphate and creatine, and we give it, we release some energy as well, because breaking bonds releases energy. That's why people call it creatine phosphate, because it's made of creatine and phosphate. So you break it down, it releases energy. This energy which is released can actually build up ADP, ADP into ATP, so you end up with ATP. And then you can actually snap this bond again and release that energy. We can actually use that energy, that ATP energy produced there, to uh, power like a very high intensity short duration exercise or activity. Okay, so about 10 to 15 seconds or less. We've got the anaerobic glycolysis system. So this uses carbohydrates as its fuel. And so you don't need oxygen for it. So if you're like puffed out, you know when you start running and the first like 10 seconds, you're not getting enough oxygen. Like your body hasn't yet adapted to the exercise. So you're like still not breathing super fast yet. Whereas you need to be building for breathing fast because you're like activating your muscles very quickly. And so what happens then is your body actually uses these anaerobic systems and it uses the ATP PC system first. And then it uses the anaerobic glycolysis system because this does not require oxygen. So glycogen is broken down to glucose, which provides the energy necessary to rebuild ADP into ATP, similar to the ATP PC system because it uses the PC for the glycogen. And the anaerobic glycolysis system produces energy at a slower rate than the ATP PC system, but it produces more ATP. So if we look at this diagram, we can see glycogen is broken down to glucose. 
So we eat carbs, which ends up body's glycogen, and it's broken down to glucose and pyruvic acid, which becomes lactic acid. We have some energy being released. That energy is re uh, used to rebuild ADP into ATP. And then once you have that bond, you can actually snap it and break it and use that energy there to actually power our muscular contractions. Okay? So continuing on from this, anaerobic glycolysis um, can produce some byproducts, which can be a bit problematic. So a byproduct of the breakdown of pyruvic acid into lactic acid is hydrogen ions. And so people think lactic acid's really bad. It's not the lactic acid itself. It's actually the hydrogen ions which are associated with the lactic acid. Because these hydrogen ions, if you chemistry, you know that protons can interfere with the acidity of environments. And so these protons can cause the muscles themselves to become acidic. We know muscles contain enzymes. Enzymes can be denated if acidity changes. And I'm getting a bit fired, like here, but just knowing a bit of background I think is good. In essence, lactic acid isn't the culprit. It's actually hydrogen ions which are the culprit because they cause acidity in your muscles and kind of interfere with the reactions happening there. As such, like, often we try and avoid using the anaerobic glycolysis system. Like, we want to get enough oxygen as fast as possible, which is why we start to increase our heart rate and breathing rate and stuff because we're trying to get the oxygen to the working muscles more quickly. And so, as a result of this, my heart rate and breathing rate will go up and... This will help us with um, preventing the cause or preventing the buildup of hydrogen ions or lactic acid. But we know lactic acid's fine. It's just it's like lactic acid's always holding hands with hydrogen ions, and so if lactic acid's there, we know hydrogen ions are also there, and we don't want the hydrogen ions there. Um. Okay, so we've also got lactate flexion point. So this refers to the last point where lactate entry into and move from the blood are balanced. So we've got a nice diagram here. So at this point here, lactate entry and removal into the blood are balanced, and the last point at which they are balanced is known as lactate flexion point. And afterwards here, lactate and hydrogen ions will accumulate the muscles and cause feelings of fatigue. Okay, so that, that causes the fatigue that we experience, or the soreness in our muscles. I'll give you guys a second to digest that. Um, Okay, so moving on from that, we're looking at the aerobic system now. So we start to increase our respiratory rate, we increase our heart rate, all of that happens. And so the reason for this is that we actually want to get more oxygen to our bodies going to the working muscles. Because then we can actually activate or increase our use of the aerobic system. And so this aerobic energy system is the only energy system that actually requires oxygen and it uses carbohydrates, which is glycogen, fats, which get broken down to free fatty acids, and in extreme cases, protein as fuels. So, pretty much it just requires oxygen, it can break stuff down. Um, it produces like way more ATP, but at a very slow rate. So, slow rate of ATP, but a far greater amount than any of the other systems. And it can be used indefinitely, such as during a marathon. Pretty much until all your glycogen and your fats run out. And it will take quite a while for fats to run out, because fats are still up in the body. So you can see here, glycogen is broken down into energy. Oh, sorry, glycogen is broken down into glucose, and this releases energy. This glucose is then broken down into pyruvic acid. In the case of the anaerobic system, this pyruvic acid is broken down to lactic acid and hydrogen ions. But here, the pyruvic acid is actually broken down to carbon dioxide, water, and heat. Because in this case, we actually have enough oxygen, sufficient oxygen, to actually break it down and release this carbon dioxide often heat instead of hydrogen ions, okay? So you can see there is a bit of a difference here. Once again, we use this energy to rebuild ADP into ATP and then release that energy. And you can use it to contract our muscles um, during events such as a marathon or you know, whatever event you're doing, which requires long-term like muscular endurance type of stuff. Here is a nice table that does summarize all of these energy systems really well. I'd kind of recommend being able to like understand and explain most of it. You don't really need to know exactly how many ATP, but definitely know the rest of it pretty well. Um, I wouldn't really recommend knowing peak power either. You don't have to know that. You don't have to know this. Just know there's a lot. 
maybe like one ATP for ATP PC, two or three, whereas this is like you know, a lot, especially for fats. Look at how much ATP we can produce with fats. So, yeah. Um, the organic phosphates are known as PI and ADP. Hydrogen ions, or PI can also interfere with the muscle acidity, I think, but it's really the hydrogen ions which are the main culprit there. So hopefully that makes sense. I might get, um, keep this up here for a few minutes. I know you guys can like access this recording later, but um, if you want to take a screenshot now so you don't forget, maybe do that now. One second, I'm going to just get a drink again. Any questions, put them in the chat please, so I can reply to them real quick, and we'll keep going. Okay, so, these are different uh, causes of fatigue. So if we deplete all the fuel in our body, um, okay, if we deplete all the fuel for the ATP PC system, like we completely run out of ATP stored at the muscles and the phosphocreatine, and this is quite common, you know, if we sprint for 15 seconds, we're going to use up all that. Um, so once these are depleted, then the body will switch over to using glycogen instead. And we know glycogen can be broken in without oxygen, so in an anaerobic environment, um, or with oxygen. So glycogen can actually give you about two to three hours worth of energy. Um, so if you're running a marathon, your body's going to switch over from glycogen to fats eventually. But for the first part of the marathon, you're going to be using glycogen mostly. Um, so the body will switch over to fats as the major producer of ATP and the exercise intensity will decrease. Um, accumulation of metabolic byproducts is another source of fatigue. So the buildup of these metabolic fatigue and byproducts, um, so ADP and inorganic phosphate levels are caused by the breakdown of ATP. They can reduce the muscle contraction force and therefore cause fatigue. Uh, also, um, hydrogen ions, I'm not sure why it's not written here. <laughs> hydrogen ions are the main, main culprit of fatigue. Elevated body temperature is another source of fatigue. So when our body temperature starts to overheat during physical activity, what happens is that, um, okay, so at rest, let me explain some stuff. Uh, your body is pumping blood around your body. So blood's going to your stomach to digest food, blood's going to your, you know, your lungs, your liver, your spleen, whatever. It's going to all these different organs. When you start exercising, your body's like, okay, you know what? Digesting this sandwich right now is not essential. We're going to be hunted by something right now, and it's really important that we actually redirect the blood flow to our working muscles so we can actually like run fast and get away from this lion or whatever. So at that moment, your body's like, it's not necessary to digest this sandwich right now. We've got more important matters right now, okay? And so it redirects the blood flow to your leg muscles, your arm muscles, or whatever. So you're running, you're running, you're running from this light, and you start to get hot, and your body is like, okay, we're getting too hot. If we overheat, we could, like, die. So the, the heart, sorry, the body is like, okay, we better cool ourselves down somehow. How do we do this? And what happens is that the blood vessels towards your skin, it vasodilates, and that means it just dilates, gets bigger. And so more blood rushes to your skin, and as a result of this, we actually have the body trying to cool down. And so we have some blood um, being lost from plasma, and we sweat. So this sweating, this evaporation process of the sweating actually cools us down. Um, it's good, it prevents us from overheating. But what the problem is that less blood and therefore less oxygen fuels actually goes to the working muscles. And because less oxygen is going to the working muscles, you've got to increase your reliance on the anaerobic energy system here. Though. So increasing your reliance on the anaerobic glycolysis system means you've got increased production of lactic acid and there's associated hydrogen ions. And so as a result of that, you are going to be experiencing more fatigue because of the accumulation of hydrogen ions there, which can interfere with the acidity at your muscles. Okay? So, once again, is it problematic for hydrogen ions? Um, and really because like, elevated body temperatures are really common cause of fatigue for the aerobic energy system. But you can see that this fatigue isn't really the fault of the aerobic system, but rather the fault of 
the anaerobic system. Okay. Um, how much time do we have left? A lot now. So, okay, I've done all that. Good slide, um, good for revision, I recommend. Reading through it, trying your best to understand it and recall what I just discussed. Um, probably when you guys download this, you can't see the word duration and intensity, so I want you guys to write the, down, down, ah, write down this entire sentence. Um, so, energy system into play. The three energy systems don't function in an on-off way. So each energy system is always kind of contributing to the rebuilding of ATP until it's completely depleted. Um, and the contribution varies depending on the duration and intensity of the physical activity. So I recommend you take a screenshot now because it might be blocking that. The last sentence there. I don't know why. It's very annoying that my slides have done this. Anyway, looking at this diagram, you can see... Well, it's hard to see. And it looks like this is at zero here, but it's not actually at zero. It should be slightly above zero. So all three energy systems are contributing at any one given time. So if we, like, look at this spot here, like five minutes, we can see we've got aerobic energy systems a bit high. Like, oh, sorry, quite low, but it's not zero. We've got ATP PC system is a bit medium, and so is the anaerobic system. And so the greatest contributor are these two systems, the ATP PC and the air anaerobic energy system. Um, as you look over time, you can see that the um, aerobic energy system actually takes over with the ATP pieces completely rapidly like declining and contributing in energy production. And this one, the anaerobic system also declines a bit. Okay, so these questions are very repetitive. You get the same type every year. Hopefully you guys have done your stack already kind of on this topic and it's very like similar. Um, I think we've got like half an hour left and it's quite a lot of reading to do. I'm just going to summarize what it says here. You guys have got this slide um, and I need you guys, I need you guys, I would like you guys to use this as a template because if you can remember how to structure your answers like this, then it should help you on the exam. So here we've got example questions saying volleyball is a team sport and matches take between 30 and 60 minutes with players having high intensity short duration movements. Such as preserving, spiking, passing, blocking, and the games are explosive in nature with rests. Discuss the energy system interplay. So you'd always, always, always start off with all three energy systems contribute to the ATP production of a player throughout the game, and their contributions will vary depending on the intensity and duration of the activity. So something like that. So all of the energy systems contribute to ATP production throughout the game, with you know, oh, the pickups, varying intensities and durations. You want to discuss all three energy systems in turn. So during when is the ATPC system predominant? So here it says, you know, during spiking and blocking, the ATPC system is predominant. When intensity is low, the anaerobic, so the aerobic glycol system will be dominant because we get enough oxygen and the demand for ATP system is high. You can also replenish the ATPC system in these periods, in these like little rest periods, I guess, um, allowing it to be used during the next point, and the anaerobic glycol system will be used during extended rallies. Um, something I would like that I would have liked these people to do. Oh, they have written it here. Multiple spikes and blocks. So you really want to call back to the data. So it says stuff like serving, passing, setting, spiking, blocking. You want to make sure that it does discuss that in the data, that your response actually says that. We're talking about rest and when you can actually recuperate that um, system. I'm guessing someone will write a question here they usually do. And I know Vika doesn't like the word predominant anymore. Um, if you just think of some other like synonymous phrases, so something like, it's the greatest contributor of energy, or produces the most energy at that time. Stuff like that is good to say. Um, I think the problem is that lots of kids were using predominant and dominant wrong. So make sure you do understand, like, you don't want to get the answer wrong. I think Vika kind of said, don't use this word anymore. So just try and say something like, the greatest contributor to energy, or contributes the most energy instead. Okay? Uh, sorry. sorry, I've got a question here. Which of the following statements is correct? During steady state, oxygen supply is equal to oxygen demand. So just in terms of energy system interplay, know what fuels are used by each energy system and how they're stored and common foods they're found in, which I didn't discuss today, but hopefully you guys do know that. 
um, understand those diagrams and you know each slide about each individual energy system that I went through. Practice these systems, interplay questions. I think this is my favorite part of the exam because if you do in our practice exams, you can see they kind of recycle the same ideas every time, which makes it a lot more convenient for when you're studying. <clears throat> cool. Um, yeah, moving on from that, put any questions in the chat once again. Now moving into acute responses, which I also really like. So we'll get a few more key terms here. Oxygen deficits when the demand for oxygen is more than the supply. Steady states when oxygen supply is equal to oxygen demand. Um, so heart rate also remains constant during this stage. Also got EPOC, which is excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption, which is how much oxygen your body consumes after exercise. And so during EPOC, we've got fast and slow phase. Um, we've got first security and NATP stores being restored at the muscles, hydrogen ions being cycled out of the body, and core body temperature being reduced and lactic acid broken down. Pretty much like your body returning back to normal is the EPOC. Then you've got a fast and slow stage. Uh, this is a formula you guys must know, which is quite annoying because I don't like saying memorize this formula if we never actually use it mathematically, but it's just something that you have to know. So, um, so it's possible for someone to actually work above their VO2 max. And so VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen that a person can take in and use per minute. Um, you can calculate using the following formula. So stroke volume times heart rate is equal um, times by AVO2 difference. Alveoli manual difference, okay? And you can work above your VO2 max, but as long as your energy is being produced by the anaerobic systems as well. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so what are acute responses? So when a person begins exercise, the body makes a bunch of different changes. And so these changes are known as acute responses and only last for the duration of exercise and immediate recovery period. So these muscles need oxygen to work, the harder the physical activity, the more oxygen they need. And so a lot of these acute responses actually revolve around getting more oxygen to the muscles. And obviously we can work anaerobically, but the problem is that working anaerobically increases the amount of fatigue we have because it means increased lactic acid and hydrogen ions being produced. And so we really want to reduce the number of iron, hydrogen ions which are produced, and so we prefer to use aerobic. And so even though it takes a while for aerobic to kind of kick in, the aerobic energy system, it is better because it doesn't produce as much fatigue. So I think I've really just outlined a few of them here. I haven't really given much explanation. My advice is to know three of these things and pl pl pick the easiest ones because you don't get extra points for picking tidal volume plateaus at a high but not maximum intensity as opposed to something you actually understand, like increased respiratory rate. And we think about it logically. Um, so increased respiratory rate. When we start exercising, we start to breathe faster. That's just, like, if you think about it, if you, if you were to get up and do a run right now, sprint, your respiratory rate would get a lot faster, right? And tidal volume is the amount of, like, oxygen taken in, or the amount of air taken in per breath, right? These increase your deeper breaths, like, bigger breaths and faster breaths, because your body wants to get more oxygen into you in order to fuse across the lungs and get to the bloodstream and get taken to the working muscles. So more oxygen to work your muscles means more aerobic energy production and less anaerobic energy production and therefore less fatigue. Okay? So they all kind of revolve around that idea. We've got a bunch of cardiovascular ones like increased heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, blood pressure, etc. Once again, pick the easiest one. You don't get extra points for picking something which is like harder. You just pick something you can actually understand. Um, this is a formula and a calculation you will need to do. So 220 take away your age is your maximal heart rate. Make sure you do write this as beats per minute because you can often get like lose marks by not saying beats per minute or miss out on marks. Uh, once again, do understand them. If you increase your heart rate, why do you increase your heart rate? Well, if the heart pumps faster, or beats faster, then you can actually pump more blood to the muscles faster. And therefore more blood means more oxygen going to the working muscles because the blood pretty much just pumps oxygen to the working muscles, right? And then more aerobic energy production as opposed to anaerobic once again okay i'm probably not going to spend a lot of time discussing avo2 difference because we don't have much time left and there's still quite a bit to get through but definitely um you know spend some time looking over this slide and trying to read it 
And I just say real quick that when we pump blood around the body, our heart pumps blood to the arteries. So blood leaving the heart goes to the arteries and blood returning back to the heart after it's been deoxygenated goes to the venules. And so comparing the amount of oxygen in each part, so from arteries to venules, will show us how much oxygen was extracted. And we want more oxygen to be extracted from the working muscles because that means our muscles have done more aerobic energy production. So having a higher ABO2 difference is good because it means something like, uh, sorry, having a, having a higher, yeah, having a higher one is good. Sorry, my mind just kind of skipped. Whereas having a smaller one means not as much oxygen was extracted. Like if you have 50 mils of blood leaving the heart and 50 mils of blood rushing back to the heart, 50 mils of oxygen, it means the oxygen hasn't been extracted. So it's not good. 50 take 50 is zero. Whereas 50 take, you know, the zero oxygen left, 50 take zero is 50. That means you've actually extracted all that oxygen. Okay? Uh, we've got a few muscular ones. So increased motor unit recruitment, increased temperature, increased production. Once again, all of these kind of aim to increase um, the amount of... Oh, they don't all do that, but they try and increase aerobic energy production. And some of these are byproducts of that increased energy production. So decrease energy substrate fuel levels because you're being you're like working hard and using up as many fuels as you can in order to increase your energy production. So decreasing energy substrate fuel levels can occur if you're using up those fuels. Okay, we've got like 20 minutes left, guys. So just working through a bit more. Once again, um, tips. Pretty much most of these air, like cardiovascular and respiratory ones Revolve around increasing oxygen supply to the working muscles. So, yeah. They're a couple really well. I have a rough idea of all the others. Beaker often asks you to like, list or define two or three. So if you know like three from each set, you guys should be covered. Okay, we've got activity analysis next. Which is the first step of designing a training program. And it's um, to guide the design of the training program by identifying the major fitness requirements fitness components and skills needed in sport. And so information included, collected, included, um, includes, sorry, skill frequencies. I just had an exam recently and my brain is still a bit post-exam mode. So hopefully I'm making sense, you guys. Um, in activity analysis, information collected includes skill frequencies, movement patterns, heart rates, and work to rest ratios. Oops. So I've also had to find a bunch of these strategies on these pages. Um, I've also included things which can affect them, which should be quite comprehensive. I might go through a few of them now, just one at a time. Um, and then, yeah. We'll try and get through them. I'm gonna definitely go through air power. So this is the maximum rate of energy production from the aerobic energy system, producing the absence of, sorry, in the presence of oxygen. So I'm gonna ask you guys what a mitochondria is, and I want you guys to put it in the chat. And if you wrote down mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell, you were wrong, because this is not a VK approved answer. You must say something like, not that you'll get this on a PE exam, but if you do your bio, something like, the mitochondria is a site of aerobic cellular respiration. Because the mitochondria is where we actually have this aerobic power being produced. We have that ATP energy being produced um, in the mitochondria. Or well, majority of it anyway. So aerobic power can be influenced by age. And it peaks around 25 to 28 years old. And gender. And so males often have a higher aerobic power due to larger heart and lungs. Just because of physical body size. Um, we've got anaerobic capacity here. I'm not going to go through all of these, as I mentioned, just because there are so many and we don't have a lot of time left. So it's really up to you guys to make sure you understand each of these. Um, something I'd encourage you guys to do is um, recognize that there are health and fitness related um, fitness components. Health and fitness. Health and sports specific, I think, fitness related. Anyway, the point is some of them are required for the general population. And that includes things like um, aerobic power, muscular endurance, flexibility, body composition. Some of these are just like expected the general population has a general level at. Also, you'll notice that we have three different types of muscular ones. We've got muscular endurance, and this is the ability of muscles to perform repeated contractions over a long period of time. 
and can be affected by genetics and muscle fiber types, such as slow twitch. So slow twitch produce um, repeated slow contractions, which is good, and fatigue. So fatigue can reduce muscular endurance. Muscular strength is the maximum force that can be produced by a muscle in one effort, and so factors which can affect it include the area of the muscle, contraction type, and speed of contraction. So muscular strength is the maximum force by one muscle in one effort. Um, and we've also got muscular power, and so this is the rapid exertion of a force over a quick period of time. Okay, make sure you do understand these three definitions and differentiate between them. I'd actually recommend like writing down the, each of the definitions and testing yourself on them, like going, okay, what's muscular power? What's muscular endurance? What's muscular strength? And being able to differentiate between them. Because this is quite common on the ECAR exam, being asked to define each of these. And I would often get mixed up between muscular power and muscular strength. Or endurance. So as I mentioned, for each of the fitness components, make sure you know a definition of the word. It doesn't have to be word for word, but learn one before the exam. Um, and factors which affect the component. Activity analysis will be in a major part of the exam, so I'm not sure why it's written there, but um, it's always the first step in designing a training program. Okay, so in terms of training data, um, training diaries can be used to record information about training sessions, such as what activities were completed. So things such as a digital activity tracker, like a Fitbit or a Garmin, I actually meant to charge my foot, but no, I just forgot. I'm not even sure where I put it. That's really annoying. Um, anyway, yeah, they're really important and they can be used to track sessions. As well as physiological data, psychological and sociological data can be taken, um, as they can provide, like, contacts. Like, if you usually run 10 kilometers every day and you look at your, your like, Fitbit and go, wow, on Tuesday I only did two. Why is that? And you go, like, and read your training diary and go, oh, okay, wait a minute, I was injured then, or it was raining then, like pouring and really dangerous conditions and so slippery and I don't want to run in that, then you've got some context and that's not like, oh, I have like these unexplained absences in my training, okay? Um, we've got three components of a training session, warm-up, conditioning, and cool-down. Warm-up is often when you're getting the body hyped up, so increasing muscle temperature, breathing, and heart rate, as well as dynamic stretching, whereas cool down is static stretching. And we're turning the body back to pre-exercise levels, like getting rid of those wastes, reducing delayed onset muscle soreness. And conditioning is the main part of the session. So it's like, if you're playing a game of basketball and you're, you're doing a coaching session with basketball, you've got your warm up and it might be doing some layups or doing some little jogging around the basketball court. Then you've got conditioning, which is the actual like half-court game you might play as practice. And then you've got your cool-down, which might be static stretching and just slow walks to return the body back to pre-exercise levels. Okay? I don't know why this is covering it. We've got about 10 minutes left, so if I try and finish this real quick. Um, so we've got quite a few training principles. Once again, I put them all here so you guys can use this as a resource, like copy, paste, make flashcards out of it. That might help you quite a bit, I think. Um, it's a really effective technique, I think. So You might think of a mnemonic like spit-off, so specificity, um, progress progressive overload, Intensity, duration, um, overtraining, etc. So just knowing quite a few of them, being able to identify and define them is a really good skill to have. Quite a few here. So once again, I have defined them all here, and you guys can use that to make flashcards or something like that. The slides are downloadable. I'm sorry to be going through this so fast. It's just there's a lot to get through still. And this is pretty straightforward. It's really just learning about it. Here are different types of training methods. Once again, um, these are quite straightforward. So I'll let you guys um, go through these in your own time. Hopefully you guys have looked at them, but this provides good definitions. Um, and just for revision as well for it.
make sure for the like interval trainings that you can remember your work to rest ratios and identify them. Um, that's really important. So I know I'm going through quite a lot of slides, but we just don't have enough time to really go through everything in as much detail as I want to. Which is annoying, but that's okay. Make sure you know different types of stretching. Ballistic stretching is pretty full on. Um, and so is PNF. Make sure you know that you can write PNF stretching because proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation is quite a long phrase and I don't even know if I can remember to write all that down. So you can write PNF, that's fine. Okay, just a bit of questions or tips and stuff there. So definitely read over this in your own time. Um, we've got chronic adaptations, which are long-term changes that happen to your body. These are different to acute um, changes, because acute changes happen in the short term, whereas chronic occur in the long term, and they occur in three, cardiovascul uh, three bodily systems, so the cardiovascular, respiratory, and muscular systems. So we've got quite a few aerobic ones, so increase in the ventricle size, in blood volume, um, stroke volume. Once again, know about three or four of them. Be able to identify why they occur and what the point is. So why do we have a large left ventricle size? Well, the left ventricle is actually the part of the heart which pumps the blood out of the heart into the arteries and off to the circulatory system. So if our left ventricle size is bigger and got more muscle, we can have a more forceful contraction of the blood out of the heart. Therefore, more blood can be pumped out of the heart and it can go to the working muscles. Therefore, more blood can go to the working muscles and provide oxygen to the working muscles and we can work aerobically better. Okay, so if you like go running, like, I noticed when I was training for, like, half marathon and stuff, like, I, my lungs felt better, I felt like I was running more effectively, more efficiently, I didn't feel as tired, and it's because these, like, fitness gains are you experiencing chronic adaptations, like, especially if you're doing lots of long distance running, you might have an increase in stroke volume, um, a decrease in your resting heart rate, like, my resting heart rate got quite a lot lower, right, quite low, actually, and so it's because your heart does grow as a muscle, and it means you've actually got you don't have to pump so many times to get as much oxygen or blood out to the working muscles. You can just pump once and because the heart's bigger, it can actually slow down. It doesn't have to work so hard all the time. It can chill out a bit because it's more effective and efficient at actually delivering that blood and oxygen. Okay? Um, I've got some definitions here, so it's good. We've got respiratory ones as well. These are all kind of based around, like, I literally found that after training for quite a bit, I felt like my lungs breathed better, and it's because I have an increased lung volume as well. So, yeah, just going through quite a few of them. And it's all good. I've got eight minutes left. I know I just skimmed through that, and I didn't really go through it with you. Please don't be mad, I have said, yeah, we don't have enough time to go through all of it and I've tried to fit an entire year's worth of content into one slide deck. But you guys will have those there. You might have to consult your textbook to get a bit more information about each of those. But also remember, you don't need to know everything about each of those topics. You only need to pick three or four and be able to define them quite well. Okay? Psychological strategies are pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's really about influencing um, your performance, um, often by mental means, so things like you know sleeping to improve your mental acuity, confidence and motivation. Um, make sure you know your inverted U graphs. Uh, I can't remember the name for them now. I'm really sad, but I was actually really surprised to see they came up in my one of my um, like psychiatry type lectures in med classes. So. This stuff is relevant in the long term if you are doing medicine or psychology or something like that. So this is how ready a person is to perform a task and it relates to arousal levels. So if you've got a very high arousal, um, you might be kind of you know, jumpy or stressed out or anxious. Whereas if your arousal is very low, you might be very unmotivated and bored. Whereas if your arousal is kind of like in the happy medium, then you'll have quite an optimal performance as opposed to these two extremes, which can vary a lower performance level. Uh, mental imagery is a really cool one because there's actually lots of research to state that actually thinking about doing a task can help build neural circuits in your brain and like strengthen them. And so you can actually strengthen these connections and improve your own performance. And so I guess it's like 
people talk about or joke about manifesting, but really, if you're manifesting something and really visualizing, you know, your basketball game tomorrow and how you need to stand to throw the ball and get in the goal or whatever, um, you are building up those neural pathways. So maybe there is some truth to manifesting. Um, so I've got concentration. It's really important that you guys do understand these four different types of concentration. I have put down an example of each of them and defined them. So do take the time to go through them. I know it's a bit difficult. If you've got a question, pop that in the chat right now. I just have a few minutes left, so I'm going to skim through towards the end. Nutritional and hydrational strategies. Make sure they say nutritional, you don't say water. Because water comes into hydration and they're a bit finicky about that. Um, other things are carb replenishments are good. So high GI foods are really good. Um, so I don't know if you guys ever go to the bakery, but I often see posts there saying high fiber, low GI. And the point of that, that's like brown bread with lots of grains in it. And the point of that is it's got a low glycemic index, which means it releases energy over a longer period of time. Which is good if you're going to be studying at school all day. You need something that releases energy over a prolonged duration. Whereas high GI food will release energy very quickly. <coughs> so things like lollies are high GI. They give you that quick burst of energy. And so after you've just done like a whole half marathon, you might want to take some high GI foods like lollies or... Um, chocolates or you know snacks and things they help to raise your blood sugar extremely quickly and should be consumed very quickly after physical activity you can use carb loading in the precursor to an um to an exam uh, to a race because it helps you to stir up the glycogen stores in your body and so you've got more glycogen which you can rely on protein replenishment is also quite useful for reburning muscles um, especially if you use resistance training and actually having like something which is high GI, carb heavy with proteins is called co-ingestion and it helps to increase um, the effectiveness of insulin, I think, in your body. Okay, we don't need to know much about that, but just say it's really good for um, increasing your you know, blood sugar very quickly and restoring it back to normal levels. Um, and the protein helps to rebuild that microtears, the microtears in your muscles. The exam is pretty big. It's worth 50% of your entire study score, which is quite a lot. It's pretty much a mark per minute. And I don't know if you guys do other subjects like bio, but in bio you actually have like 40 practice questions. Sorry, 40, not practice questions, multiple choice questions, which means less writing time. It's just circle. Whereas this one's only got 15 multiple choice questions, which means you've got way more short answer external response questions, which is more writing, which is kind of very annoying. So I'm just going to discuss how I personally study for exams. So um, I think your exam might be at a different time. But there is some general information. Once again, this is like ginormous writing. I don't know why. Wait a minute, can you guys not see me? Let's do that. Anyway, um, so we do have a few months still before the exam, as in like two months. So right now, I would recommend you guys try and get all the content done. I know you've got the holidays about now-ish, I think. So if you can try and get all revision done, even if you haven't finished your stats yet, I reckon you'd put you in good stead for the exam. Good stead, stead for the exam. So um, you're trying to get all the revision done, working through like you know, using slides like this as a basis, but also printing out the entire study design. I would laminate it, that's what I did, and then like tick off each dot point as I went through it and try and make sure I understood it all and I could explain it to someone else. I found that to be a really effective tool because it kind of made sure that I could articulate it in a way that's um, like understandable by the examiner. And find as many practice exams as possible as you can do. So I find, um, 15 to 20 is generally a number that I think is quite suitable. The people I've talked to who did really well in VCE, they did at least 15 for each subject they scored like 50 in. So yeah, like 40, 50 study score in. So I think doing something like this can help you feel more confident with the exam and you kind of get used to seeing the questions. So you'll start to see the same question over and over again and go, ah, so Vika always asks this every year, which is kind of like, feels like you're cheating, but it's not because you're allowed to do these practice exams. So that's really good. What I did was I would make a note of every question that I was a bit unsure of and put it in a notebook. And I'd also, like when I corrected the exam, even if the ones I was unsure of, I'd write like notes about why I was unsure about it or 
like review a bit. I'd also um, make notes on every question that I um, every question that I got wrong, and I'd also review it and read up on it and stuff, and put that into my notes as well. So I just found that doing this helped me. Like I would review it, write a paragraph about it, review it again before I went to bed. Just help me understand where I was going wrong and help me consolidate errors that I wasn't doing well at. Um, you can either ask your teacher to mark your exams or do it yourself. Um, and then what I did was I'd also put into the ATI Notes forum because that's free and there was always someone like available to help really quickly. Like I think my fastest response time from someone else was like 32 seconds or 16 seconds. It was like I put in a question, someone answered it instantly nearly. So um, yeah, using those free resources. Um, study those questions you got wrong, add them to your notes, keep revising, do as many exams as you can, especially those VCA ones which are on the website, as well as the Northern Hemisphere ones. So if you look up VCA and HT exams, I'm not sure if there are any for PE, but definitely for bio there are. Um, they're pretty much the same, they are the same study design, they just conducted a different time of year in July, because I think some Northern Hemisphere students use them. So yeah, you've got tons of practice exams, keep reviewing, keep revising, and you guys have got this. So... I know it's kind of a heavy month and it's not a fun grind. I'm also in my exam season right now too and it's not fun. But you guys can do it. Like you worked really hard all year and now it's just time for the final revision, the final hurdle and you'll be done. So good luck with it. Um, if you have any questions, add them in the chat. Let me know how you feel.